to an emergency Rugger Report Exiles podcast. I'm Richard Spear, and you join us on the day that Jack Ross has left the club. Jack leaves Sunderland after almost 16 months in charge, two unsuccessful trips to Wembley, one manager of the month award, and a record of played 75, won 38, drawn 27, and lost 10 with a win ratio of 50 point. Six seven percent. So the exiles have assembled around their microphones to give their perspective on what is still basically a breaking story. Uh, broke about four hours ago. We'll talk about why Ross has gone, who we think is going to make a good replacement, and how all this plays out in the light of possible takeovers, etc. So we'll all be keeping half an eye on the game that kicks off in a very short while at the Stadium of Light in the AFL Trophy against Grimsby. I think we've got a couple of the lads on the line who've actually got the game running in the background there. But I think we'll all agree that the uh, managerial merry-go-round will take precedence. We have down the line from Lincoln Rugger Report Exile regular John Stacey. You all right there, mate? Hello, Rich. Yeah, good, thanks. How are you? I'm fine, mate. Yeah, a bit shocked after today's news. I wasn't quite expecting it, but these things quite, happen. Quite the roller coaster, eh? Quite the it roller was. coaster. It has been, it has been. And also from Lincoln, we're joined by Danny Roberts. You all right there, mate? Yeah, not too bad. Happy too that bad. the news has come out today and he's gone let's move on as a football club and last but by no means least we're joined by chris Wynn, a regular contributor to the rogue report blog um but first time on this podcast he's in sheffield how are you doing there chris not bad thanks rich all the better for a bit of drama today not a bad time to have the exiles debut eh? yeah making your debut mm. so chris we're gonna um leave the traditional exile introduction i think to another day and jump straight into the main topic of conversation. Were you somebody calling for Ross's head before this uh, news broke today? Not for a while. Uh, I did a piece on the site, what, two or three weeks ago, that's soon. And I kind of made the argument that were things actually that bad? You know, we were three points off automatic place. We had a game in hand. You know, we, we kept picking up after having these runs of drawing a couple of games. And I was thinking, well, if you were in Stuart Donald's shoes, you've got to weigh up the risk of getting rid of Ross against, um, you know, keeping him in place. Because it did look, and it's kind of still debatable whether Jack Ross is a guaranteed top six finish. So that was my argument. But just every time he kept these one ones came up, or we kept having a Bolton or a Lincoln, just the confidence just kept getting chipped away. And I think you could see the same. Not just with a section of fans, but with the players as well. There was a few of them whose heads went down. And it just kept chipping away these odd runs, these blips we kept having. And it was clear that, you know, but there was a good piece on the site the other day about the stats and how we're attacking intent and how we've been defending. And if you look how many draws, and I mentioned in the piece as well, how many draws we've had already, you extrapolate that over the course of the season and we're on course to draw another 16, 17 games this season, which means another probably. You know, fifth, sixth position finish. So for Stuart Donald, it's it's going to be a risk of saying, do do I go for it? Do we just go for that top two, or do I stick with Jack Ross and have a what was probably considered to be a safe pair of hands for a top six finish? Because you've got as much risk as dropping down the league as you have for pushing for that top two, depending on who you get. And that that just makes this next appointment absolutely huge. I mean, you go back to. The, the appointment from last season, how big that was in getting that, you know, Jack Ross right. And even going back to Dennis Smith kind of 30 years ago, if that if didn't get that right, you know, you're talking about the whole direction of a club. You know, if we spend too long in, in League One, you just don't know what's going to happen. So it's only taken recently for for me to to kind of turn on, on Jack Ross. But I think with the way the fans were, I think it's it, it's been inevitable and the writing's been on the wall for a while. So to be fair to, to Stuart Donald, seems good time and, and and he's pulled the trigger so we move on I think from my perspective I, I've been a big defender of, of Jack Ross up until I think about half half an hour into the uh, Bolton Wanderers match where uh, I was in the away end and it dawned on me you know just looking at the game that the players weren't playing for him and I think um, that is something that a lot of people have spoken about after the Lincoln City match as well and John um, you were at the Lincoln City match. You're a, you're, you're a resident of the of the city, and you've been very critical of some of Ross's team selections recently, particularly in goal. So, are you glad to see the back of him? Um, yeah, I, I was in the same 
vote as Chris for a while. I was I was very much trying not to get on the extreme bandwagon of um, really early into the season, panicking and thinking, what are we doing? But for me as well, echoing what you said, I think there was a point, I think it was the Peterborough game, where I was looking at the team the smallest thing that they did, you know, would just be huge. Um, it looked like a completely different team, you know, looking back at even even towards the end of last season, there were parts of the the running at the end of the season where we still had a bit of fight in us and there was still a bit of organisation and it was it just looked like it was all going wrong at Peterborough onwards, really. Uh, I know we had a couple of good results in between. But yeah, I think I think it's team selection plus there's there's lots of other factors, but some of these team selections, I've been quite vocal in saying they look like he's trying to troll us. He's trying to like um, wind fans up on purpose. He plays uh, a team that were comfortable against a Premier League team, regardless of them playing the reserves, and then strips it back for the next game and changes it completely. He does things like watch players absolutely play out the skin, look like they're really turning on, you know, the afterburners like George Dobson, etc., working really well with other players. And then he splits it up again and ch- changes the partnerships around. And we spoke um, we spoke on the last part and uh, one of the lads was talking about partnerships and triangles and, and keeping consistency. I'd love to know a stat if we've kept the same 11 more than two or three times at all this season, you know, apart from the last two games where we did. And, and that's clearly not an excuse because we won a game and then got battered by Lincoln. But that's one factor that the inconsistency in the team selection overall so far. I think on top of that, the 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 weariness, the attitudes of the players. We talked earlier in the season about um, fear, the fear factor and the attitudes of the players. I think that's just getting worse and worse and worse at a critical time where the players need to stand up and be counted and and give it a bit more, uh, give it a bit more oomph, basically. You know, want to play for the game, want to play for the ball, and the basics. And the, and the third thing for me is the basics. You know, watching them against Lincoln on Saturday was, um, for want of a better way of describing it, um, worse than some of the Sunday league football I played. Watching us with the ball, it was like delusions of grandeur, left, right, and centre. There were players trying to do Cruyff turns near their 18-yard box. There was not tracking uh, runners, so one twos were going round players like they weren't even there there was no desire to get into what into their 18 yard box whereas all you saw from Lincoln was the complete opposite you know people following runners people tracking back their whole team was running back um quickly and we were taking our time going forward it was just it was like watching uh, kind of like Lincoln were a Premier League team and we were the League One League Two team it was insane and, and, and arguably, you know, our fans are expecting us to be a thousand times better than we are. Some for justifiable reasons, you know, the players on the on the team sheet, most of which should be playing at a high level, we keep saying this, uh, and the club as a, as a whole should be playing at a high level. So um, I don't think it's unfair to think that we should be beating teams like Lincoln and obviously living here and, and knowing the team and knowing what they've done over the last couple of years is brilliant. But, you know, I think most Lincoln fans would admit that they played OK and better than they have done on Saturday, but they were mega up for it. And ultimately, if we played to our to our best capabilities, they'd have still got beat. And I think they'd have known that and expected that. So I think the right, like Chris says, the right was on the wall. It was for a while, for the last, last month, I think. And the nail in the coffin, to, to use another cliche, was was Lincoln, really. I think, I, I mean, my reflection on the games that I've seen this season um, and listening, you know, really carefully on the commentary on, on Saturday has been that, you know, the players do need to take some responsibility for the fact that their manager's got the sack but ultimately his job was to inspire confidence and belief in that set of reasonably talented footballers for this level and to to set them out there with with a plan the motivation to get the results and I didn't see it and I think I think the doubt in my mind came in at in the playoff final where it was that same feeling of either fear or lack of confidence or lack of belief in the plan that they'd been sent out there to do and uh, I, I had turned I have to say and I, and I wasn't surprised by the decision today I was I was kind of shocked that it had come but I wasn't surprised if you know what I mean now Danny you were there on Saturday as well what's your perspective on it? are you are you happy to see him gone do you think it's going to be the thing that that changes our season I think I echo the same kind of thoughts as everyone else so far. I mean, 
I can't really put my finger on why it's went sour with Ross. He started quite well. I think, obviously, we got off to that really good start against Charlton in the 90th minute winner. We had Mumba playing. We started, like, I think we beat Scunthorpe 3-1. We looked really good. We were attacking. And I think it sort of started a twist when Ross started to learn that teams were coming to the Stadium of Light and it was their cup final and they'll go for it for the first, what, 30 minutes. And we'd have to kind of pen ourselves in a little bit just to get these teams to tire themselves out. And it's not like all gung-ho against us. And then we'll capitalise in the second half. And then it continued and it continued and it got worse and it got worse and it got worse. After two, when, it, when we reached 2019, it, it just got even worse. I remember seeing a stat that Lyndon Gooch last season He'd scored about seven, or was indirectly involved with seven goals before Barnsley, when, when we just met Barnsley that day. And from that day onwards, he didn't score again. And he got one or two assists. The same happened with Chris Maguire. So what happened, whatever happened after November, something happened with our attack and play, and something just went horribly wrong. We won 14 games in 2019, We've drawn 16. We've lost six. I can't understand why anyone can just sit back and say, oh, do you know what? That's actually all right. That's all right for a team who's chasing promotion from the League One to the Championship. It's not good enough. Whatever way anyone wants to spin it. I was listening to BBC Newcastle tonight and they were spinning it like it was a poor decision to get rid of Ross. It was, it's a bit, it's a surprise that it came so quickly and that, but when you factor it all, all the 2019 in, it is astonishing that it lasted so long. Um, I, obviously, I was at the game on, on Saturday and it's up there with one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. Probably harsh on Lincoln, but not embarrassing moments of my life. The most embarrassing moments as a Sunderland fan. I remember getting beat 3-1 against South End. Now Quinn was still in charge. That was a low moment as a Sunderland fan and Lincoln on Saturday was on par with that. We were so bad. We didn't even look like we wanted it. And it was just inevitable. When the game started, and you just thought, nah, there's only one winner here. They want it more. We're not doing anything. We're not making any kind of challenge to win second balls. We're not making any kind of effort. And it was very similar against Peterborough. We were getting done on the counter-attack down there um, on the flanks. Bruno Andre, they, him on the right-hand side for Lincoln he won that game for them because he just had acres and acres of space and he was running the show. And for a team who should be up there and challenging, that's not acceptable. We've played three or four teams in the top 10 this season and we've made, I think we've got one point and we've looked abysmal in all the games. So something has to change. I can't disagree with Stuart Donald's choice to get rid of him. Probably should have happened sooner, but at least it's happened now. And it's just getting the right manager in now who's got the experience and the League One know-how because I think that's very important to get us up. That is what, what Stuart Donald was saying on the radio this, this evening, wasn't it? That he's, he's looking for a manager who can get us promoted and that does bring us on to potential replacements for, mm-hmm. for Jack. Obviously, we've got James Fowler in charge of the, the match tonight. We're nine minutes in. I, I haven't had an update to say if there's been any change in the score. I don't know what the lad, any of you who've uh, been um, no. <laughs> glancing at the side of you. How are we playing up to this point? Uh, not bad going forward. Um, it's looking like Nyan is playing on the left wing. Um, oh, make of that, the left wing. Yeah, yeah. Make of that how you feel. I mean, I, I, I really feel like goalkeeper is the only, the only position he hasn't played in so far. Um but yeah, he's he's on the left wing. McNulty's playing behind Greg, um, and the rest you can sort of work out really. He has looked good at nine actually from the left wing. Surprisingly, he keeps coming inside. He's had a couple of shots. Um, going forward, we've actually looked quicker as far as like getting into that danger zone, that danger area. We're sort of a bit more em- impetus on that. On that, Mumba's looked all right right back. Yeah, it's not too bad. Grimsby have had a couple of chances, but we've kind of stopped them. And Burge came flying out of his goal from a free kick and took it cleaner than, I don't know, Schmeichel in his heyday, um, which just, again, made me feel sick about the fact that John McLaughlin started on Saturday. After everything I said, it's like, why didn't Jack Ross listen to the podcast and listen to what I was saying? 
but um, yeah, Burge is looking mm-hmm. all right so far too. Great. So, um, so I think we'll come to to Chris for your perspective on who you might want to see as the as the new manager. Do you, does anyone want the latest odds on who it's going to be? Because they have changed over the last half an hour. <laughs> They've changed a few times. I keep checking them. And it's been a different person favourite every time I've checked. So I don't know what the very latest is. I checked them about ten minutes ago. And Ainsworth was three to one. Ainsworth is now at five to two. So uh, these short his odds have been shortening quite considerably over the past hour well, or so. Half an hour ago, Stendhal was five to two favourite, and then it changed to Ainsworth three to one. So it's just changing it. I think with these with these uh, markets, if someone puts a fiver on, it swings the whole thing. Bookies, bookies can't stand uh, next permanent manager because there's always someone in the know. So as soon as any money drops on one person, it just throws, it just skews all the odds. So who would you like to see, ignoring the names on that list that I've got in front of me? That we, who who <laughs> fulfills your criteria? What are your well, criteria and who well, fulfills them? Well, that's it. It's, it's, it's kind of two different questions, isn't it? It's who do you want and who do you think will get in? Because... <laughs> There's probably two different answers. I mean, looking at the list, I mean, it's a big long list when you when you've been looking at the odds, and um, that seems to go down to you know, the likes of Sol Campbell and people like that. Um, ridiculous ideas. But if there's even a sniff of getting them, and I, it's only a remote sniff, but if they get, you know, a little word that he might be interested, I'd I'd go all out for for Chris Hewton. Um, it, and I know it's, I, I think it's pie in the sky stuff, but I, I just think there's that sliver that you might think this could be a long term thing. Because I think, I think Hewton likes that sort of thing. I think, you know, with his, his, you know, he had a big kind of turnaround at Newcastle to do. Brighton was a big job. And, and all of these jobs have had that feel about it where it's not, he's not kind of parachuted in for six months or six games or something like that. He's always had these things where he's, he's taken them on and he's, He's moved them forward. So I, I think it's pie in the sky, but he's probably the best name on the list. I'm not sure about Stendhal. I mean, I know he, he, he did well with Barnsley, but he's only had the Hanover job and he's only had the, the Barnsley job. So I don't know. Is, is that enough to go on? It might be. I, I don't know. It, it would it would be a risk. And that, that, that's what I'm seeing at the list as well when I when I look at the list. Um, and I think I think Hewton's kind of the, the the certainty on there who, who would actually take us forward. I mean, uh, you've got Ainsworth looking good, but I don't think he'll leave, leave Wickham. Um, people are mentioning Gary Rowett, Parkinson, not sure about those. Uh, bringing Roy King back, you know, it, it might work, but I'm, I'm not completely convinced. You know, I'm not sure he, he'd come back. I'm not sure he's kind of the sentimental type of fellow who'd do that sort of thing. Um, Kevin Phillips, I saw Mickey Gray on social media was banding Kevin Phillips around and he's 10, well he was 10 to 1 about 15 minutes ago, he's probably about 3 to 1 after Mickey Gray said that, but I'm not sure about the Phillips argument either, I mean it, it, it smacks to me of the you know, the, inev- the inevitable Shearer appointment at Newcastle, it's like well you know, I'm looking for reasons why we would bring Kevin Phillips in and, and you start asking yourself, well why not Peter Reid why not Kevin Ball, you know <laughs> and it's the same type of argument he's, he's only been a coach recently uh, for kind of championship clubs and you know we've got ex-pros all over the place so just because he was a good striker I mean does that I don't know would he have the fans completely behind him I'm just not sure you know even you know you, you look at ex-players you've got I mean, even the likes of Colin Pascoe was the assistant manager to Liverpool about four years ago and nobody mentions him and uh, certainly he'd be nowhere near the job but that that's kind of the argument with Kevin Phillips. I'm not quite sure. So uh, there's nobody really on the list that jumps out and says, you know, that oh, we should definitely appoint him. And uh, like I said, the only one who I'd go all out for if I was if I was the ownership and I had a word that he might be interested would would be to try and speak to Chris Hewton. I I think uh, Hewton was was a was a name that came to mind for me when I started to think about who could replace Ross and and one of the big factors for me is I think we need a, a manager who can deal with the the pressure of being some of the manager I think that ultimately may well have been what has been Jack Ross's undoing I think he's a he's a clever 
he's a clever guy. I think he's he's a he's a he's a good guy, and he, and he's done some fantastic things for the club. Um, certainly stabilising us and bringing in some some half decent players. Um, not necessarily everything that we've we've needed. I think particularly the team lacks uh, pace and power. I think that's that's a point that a lot of people have made in the past. Um, but Hutton, from my perspective, would be great acquisition for the club. I don't know what anyone else's perspectives on it are. Um, John, what do what do you think? Yeah, I was just listening to Chris then, and, and if I'm honest, I hadn't even thought of Chris Hutton. I hadn't even realised it was. I know he's saying it's a glimmer of hope, but I, I didn't really even consider it to be a potential option. I kind of agree. Uh, know, knowing what he's achieved and, and and what he's about, he's an all-rounder. You know, he's a, by the sounds of it, he's a good coach. He's good at developing players, and he's good at, uh, at managing um, uh, fairly big clubs. I mean, you know, Newcastle are nowhere near as big as us, like, but obviously he's he's been there, so he's got a bit of experience there. I, I've been thinking of the, exactly the same as Chris. You know, my ideal world. Um, and kind of the realistic side, and I've been taking it the same sort of way um, as Chris has, and thinking, well, on an, in an ideal world, you know, I think we we'd argue and we'd say, you know, let's have Kevin Phillips and Kevin Ball joint managers because we love them so much. But um, you know, it, Chris has made a very valid point there in saying that you know they don't have the experience. You know, right now we're struggling because Jack, Jack Ross. One of the reasons he struggled is because he's um, not had the experience at this level the experience with a big club managing a big club neither of them have you know as much as sentiment sentiment will say yeah let's get them in we need someone um you know Stuart Donnelly he he needs to have his head screwed on to a point of like and I'm sure he does do this where he doesn't need to please the fans he needs to please the fans in an appointment that's going to create results and get us promoted so he said the right thing there and whether it follows follows through is a different thing as as far as who's going to do that I actually agree again with Chris that the list is huge and it's really slim pickings for people who can fit that criteria. Stendhal's got Barnsley promoted. Yeah, that's his only achievement. So he, te- effectively, that's a box ticked, but lack of experience. And all the other names that have been bandied about, Rowett, Parkinson, um, even Adkins, you know, people who've had success in and around this level and with big clubs, they've also had like really bad situations and really bad teams that they've done really poorly with and um, when they are relatively big clubs so uh, I'm completely stumped with it if I'm honest the only thing the only major opinion I've got of the whole kind of debate is um, I really 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 don't like the idea of Roy Keane coming I think that uh, he had some success when he was at, at the club before the success he had at the club I think was a lot to do with um, signings he made and um, him being the person he is was perfect for that time in our lives as a club in the championship I think it's different it, the feeling is definitely different here I think that looking at the players it's a different sort of attitude and a different sort of set list of things that need to change that I don't think he's capable of doing um, and I don't think he has the experience to do that and since he left us, um, or was sacked, I can't quite remember what happened there, um, he, he hasn't done anything, he hasn't done anything good, he's been assistant manager a couple of places, he failed miserably at Ipswich, you know, what, why does that give him the credibility to come back and save us again, you know, I, I don't get it at all, the, the Kino argument. Um, so yeah, I think I'm stumped as well, completely stumped where we're going to go. Um, you know, again, you know, third option, really thinking of the two options, maybe we take a punt on someone who is a, a, a League Two manager doing really well or or even somebody who um, is in the sort of same vein as Ainsworth. But again, Ainsworth just strikes me as someone who's, who's, who's incredibly lucky at the moment. And actually previously, apart from this season and, and half of last season, he's been terrible as a manager. He's really struggled. Um, I think that would be a panic to take Ainsworth just because he's doing well at the minute. So yeah, I'm, I'm completely stumped. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I think everyone is, and obviously it's none of us are going to be involved in the decision making. But I think, from my perspective on on the names that you've mentioned, the one that did jump out at me was Nigel Adkins because of what he what he achieved with um, Southampton in the in the past. But as you say, uh, when I looked into his records, Sheffield United, he had them in League One and was sacked actually in, in not particularly uh, too dissimilar circumstances to Jack Ross being sacked, you know, six, seven in the league. 
personally, I think we just need someone who can command respect, which brings us to another name. And I'd like your perspective on this, Danny. Um, there's been a lot of talk for the last few weeks, actually, about Big Sam Allardyce and whether he would be willing to come back, whether it's realistic, because I've, I've no doubt that he'd do a good job. You know, he knows the game inside out. What's your perspective on that? It's, it's funny that you've mentioned Sam Allardyce and came to me because I was sat there listening. It just There's a sense of realism that's needed from Sullen fans at this precise moment. Um, a lot of people will have to seriously realise that we're a League One club and managers like Sam Allardyce, potentially Chris Hooten, are probably out of our range at the moment. I don't think managers like that are realistic for Sunderland right now. Obviously, I love Sam Allardyce. A lot of people do, but he's going to be waiting around for his Christmas Premier League job. Everyone knows that's going to happen. He's going to go to some Premier League club in the relegation zone or around the relegation zone and keep them up. It's how Sam Allardyce works. It works for him. Gets good money for it. <laughs> he's not coming to Sunderland. Hooten, he's turned down... Well, it sounds like he's turned down big jobs at, say, Sheffield Wednesday for one. I know he was no, he was at Brian. So yeah, Huddersfield. It, I doubt, very much doubt, he's going to come to Sunderland. So it leaves us with that pool of managers that might not be very attractive to the majority or some Sunderland fans. But in reality, it's it's our pool and it's what we're going to have to pick from because we're a League One club. I sort of like Stendhal. He did a good job at Barnsley. He played attacking football. I kind of like the idea of Gary Warrett and Kevin Phillips' assistant. It's a bit of a Sunderland feel to it. I'm going to throw out a curveball, actually. And go on, then. We could go down the Dortmund route, and I would like the Dortmund, and go to Dortmund 2 manager. Mike Tolberg's their current manager. But you look at Daniel Fark, did a fantastic job at uh, Norwich. Devin Wagner did a fantastic job at um, Huddersfield. I know Jan Seward replaced him and didn't really do much at Huddersfield, but they've got a good pedigree, Dortmund 2 managers, and it is nice attacking, passing football, and hey, I, I've never seen Mike Tilburg, but he's manager of Dortmund 2. So it, it's another option to Sunderland, what we could go down, someone interesting, good, good pedigree. It is a big shame because the Cowleys at Lincoln are now... Obviously, Huddersfield, if we made the change two, three weeks, well, before they moved to Huddersfield, I think they would have took the chance. I think they would have come to Sunderland. A massive club. We just missed out. We just missed out. Yeah. And we, they're so meticulous how they play. We take it into sections. Everyone goes into the right position. I, I think they would have been very good for the job. But again, it's that's sailed now. So it's a difficult one. One person who hasn't been mentioned is Ian Holloway so far. Um, I know a couple of people have said no, his name. <laughs> Charlie Adam. Charlie Adam tweeted about him today in Sunderland, interestingly. It's going to be someone like that, and Sunderland fans are probably going to have to accept that it's not going to be the most desirable name, but hopefully we get the right one, and it's someone who can play at nice attack in football. I think the style of play is, is, a, is a major criteria. No, knowledge of the Knowledge of the league is a, is a big criteria because many people have, have suggested that Jack Ross, coming from Scotland, having never played in England, never played in English football, um, he has all the coaching credentials, the intelligence, the you know the knowledge of the game. But did he know the league well enough when he came into it last year, and has he adapted to it? Is is a big question. And and then there's the and the inspiring confidence and the inspiring the, the team to play for them and having someone who can command that respect. Now, I certainly don't want to go down the centre and you know, um, throw in Kevin Phillips into his first managerial job at Sunderland. I think that would be probably something that he wouldn't want to do, um, to be absolutely frank. But I do, I do think that we, well, we've got this couple of weeks to, to uh, mull it over. I think hopefully he's going to be doing it over the next couple of days. In his interview today, Stuart Donald did uh, talk about Stendhal, saying he, he is somebody who they will look at. And the timing, um, although he, he didn't suggest that there was anything uh, more than a complete coincidence for the timing of Stendhal leaving Barnsley yesterday and, and Ross today, the timing is uh, fortuitous. And, and I can see 
that being quite an easy decision for Stuart Donald to make. But who knows? Just on the uh, Allardyce thing, he, he was on TalkSport today and actually ruled himself out. So oh, I didn't see that. Not, not that it was much of a chance anyway, but he said he wouldn't go back. So I, I think that's probably sensible, isn't it, not to go back? And I think the same with, with Keane. I think that eight years out of the game in, in terms of management isn't necessarily ideal. And although he put a rocket up the arses of a, a lot of the players and some of whom have not been performing at all to their potential, well, they wouldn't have been here long if they kept performing like that with with. Uh, Keen in charge. I just can't see it working, um, and I think it would probably end up with a. Um, <laughs> well, some people have suggested um, a fisticuffs of some sort. You never know. He's been touted for the Millwall job as well, hasn't? He? Yeah. I mean, just we've all been talking about the, this list that the bookies have got, but and I know Stuart Donald's been on today, but you just hope they've got something, some sort of idea of what direction they want to go in, and they're not just you know, getting into the office tomorrow morning with a blank sheet of paper because it, it just smacks of trying to wing it if if they haven't got an idea in mind. Because what, what you don't want to do is swing from, you know, Jack Ross who, you know, brought a certain type of player in. I know we've, we've got a recruitment team, but swing to another type of manager and then we'll, we'll find ourselves in that position again where we're just bringing a manager with completely different ideas who's just going to keep bringing new players in and we're going to have to chop and change all the time and we're back to square one. So, you know, is it going to be a short-term manager that just to get us the motivation to get up or are we looking at a, a long-term appointment? It's just going to be, it's so huge, this appointment. It's going to, you know, impact what the club's going to be like, you know, for the next five, ten years. Absolutely. And I, and I, and I know we don't, we don't know any, any details um, beyond what's publicly available about takeovers, etc. But that is the context in which these conversations are going on. And, and um, on Twitter today, I know not everyone who listens will be on Twitter. Stuart Donald was saying that you know he will he will have something to say in the, in the in the next couple of days. And then on BBC Newcastle uh, this evening, he made the point that there there isn't he he would be able to say. If, if everything had fallen apart, but not everything has fallen apart, so he can't he can't he can't say um, what what's happening with that. But that does set the context of it, and actually might set the context in terms of the resources we've got to bring a new manager in, um, in terms of their wages and what's promised down the line in terms of funds available, which is what managers are often most concerned about. Is anyone there still watching the match? Is there is there an update with the score? Uh, it's still nil nil. Yeah, they've Grimsby have had a couple of chances. What more in a nine of swap sides? Not much has happened. Burge had a bit of an injury to his finger. I nearly cried, but he's all right. He's fine. And then yeah, we've had a, just just had a couple of attacks now. What more looked good? And I think Grig had a header, which surprise surprise was really tame. But yeah, we're, we're not looking too bad. We're um we're moving forward quicker as I said there are times when we slip back into that really slow build up but Grimsby is so poor that actually it's looking all right it just makes me think if we were against anyone half decent would be terrible but there are also times where it seems like Fowler's doing something different where he's asking them to bomb on as quick as possible look for gaps look for the lines where we can play people in like what more with a bit of pace etc and so it's looking quite fun to watch the best thing about the whole game though is Super Georgie Dobson has clattered about seven of Grimsby's players, like one by one, just slide tackles, like epic Kevin Ball style tackles. Um, he seems really up for it tonight. So, yeah, nil nil. Uh, a lot of people are aware of my views on uh, George Dobson in that I think he's a, a very talented player and uh, probably his performance at, uh, where was it, Burnley, was one of the most enjoyable to watch as a, as a fan in the stands. His energy was, was, was really good and it's good to know that he's getting his foot in as well because Again, that is something in some ways that, that we've lacked in certain respects. So we we haven't got a manager. We've got Fowler in charge. We're we're nil nil uh, at home to Grimsby in the um the FL Cup. And we're gonna bring this to a close. But before I bring it to a close, has anyone else got anything they they want to bring up at this point? Just I think it's worth saying just about Jack Ross. I mean, I don't think I, you know, when I got the news, I was you know, a little bit shocked because I, I would have expected it closer to the weekend. But, you know, I, I didn't find myself kind of, you know, jumping up and down and, and celebrating. I know a few probably out there probably were when they got the news. But I think time will be 
you, you know, quite kind to to Jack Ross. I think that the kind of further away we'll get away from what the state that the club was in last season, I think uh, people will look back and think, actually, you know, he steadied the ship last season. I mean, if we'd picked the wrong person at the beginning of last season, we could have easily plummeted down, finished toward, you know, even mid-table or something last season would have been a disaster. You know, like last season, he was, you know, as much as we drew and as much as the second half of the season was disappointing and it was, you know, we, we were still one goal and a penalty shoot out away from a promotion and cup double and I think when when we remember that in, in a few years time we'll say okay you know he had his faults and you know it didn't end great even though we are I think he was he was still probably you could say more than likely a guaranteed top six finish and it's still a, it's still a risk getting rid of him but it's probably the right decision but I still think he, he did a, he did a decent job at Sunderland. He wasn't, you know, we'll talk about some of the managers in the past, and we've had some we've had some horrors, and he's he's not certainly not in that bracket. You know, Sunderland have net sacked many managers when we've been fifth or sixth in the table. That's not usually what, what you know the point where Sunderland going to sack managers, and that's just purely a a result of the situation that the club finds itself in being in League One. It's not, you know, it would have been great if I think everyone everyone wanted to them to do well and everyone was behind them beginning of last season and it's kind of slowly eroded away so a bit of a bit of a kind of a sad thing what's happened but at the minute it looks like it's the right decision and, and hopefully we make the right appointment and uh, and kick on because that, that's the aim of the the decision that they've made to actually finish top two because uh like i said with with what it looks like with a playoff finish is obviously not good enough so that's the aim of the finish so let's hope um that's how it turns out yeah, it's, it's, yeah. There's, de- there's definitely a risk involved, isn't there, in this decision? And I know, I know there's a person particularly close to me who, who, who would be saying to me, be careful what you wish for, both in terms of, of new managers and potentially new owners. So, I, I mean, I, I like I said earlier, uh, I'm a very recent uh, person uh, to, to, to come over to the, the Ross outside. And I, I really hope we remember his time here fondly. I hope he has provided us with the, the platform for future success. Did anyone else want to come in on that? Yeah, I just uh, I just wanted to say something really quickly, basically around the fact that it's two things really. Jack Ross's time, you know, he did he did a arguably a really good job last season. You know, like Chris said, a goal and a penalty shootout away from a promotion and a cup double um, on the fact that he started with nine players, you know, at the start of the season, not many managers at any level could, could have done what he did. Um, especially, especially, I know we're bemoaning the fact that he didn't know the league, but especially because he didn't know the league and didn't know how it worked. We've got to remember that. And effectively as well, I mean, just kind of deviating slightly from um, kind of the timing question of getting rid of him. Effectively from different points at the start of the season, I think different sets of fans have realised or thought to themselves in their own mind that he's had his chance last season and he's kind of lost it now. Um, bringing the players in, losing the players we got, etc. was the first step and the second step was the sort of inconsistency of results and, and ultimately leading to Lincoln. But I think the um, uh, the big thing, that the big question really for me was if we'd have got promoted last season with Jack Ross, how good would he have been in the championship? You know, looking at what he he struggled to do this season. Is it a completely different ball game altogether? Would he have had more money? Would he have brought in better players? Would we have struggled completely? There's loads of questions there. Um, would he got us relegated, you know, for all we know? And would we have had to made, make the same change, but in the championship? And then that poses another question, really. When we're looking at a manager, uh, some of the thoughts that have been going through my head looking at some of these names for a new manager, um, some of them are looking like the kind of players that, the kind of managers, sorry, that could get us promoted, yeah. But then where could they go? You know, I don't think, I don't think a lot of these managers, like Danny said, that are at the level we're at could take us any further. So is it a case of get a manager in, get us promoted, you know, give it them till the end of the season kind of job? And hopefully they get us promoted because they know what they're doing and they can get, get teams in this league promoted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then are the, are the, are the, are the owners, the new owners, whoever's in charge, um, are going to have to sit down and go, well, right, who's going to kick us on now? Because this person, we're already risking you know, a lot here um, with the person who isn't tested at the championship level. And I think that's the way football's gone. You know, Even the sort of like sort of 10, 15 years ago, um, era, you, you could have a manager that could go three or four leagues before they find that they're, they're, they're well beyond their, their level. 
and I just think there's there's big big differences between the leagues now. So that's another concern for me. You know, are we taking a short term punt here um, with whoever we end up getting, or do we have to because we're not in a position to get someone who can get us up up a league or and stay there or even push on for the Premier League? So. There's a lot of things to consider and um, I am feeling quite positive, believe it or not. That sounded really negative in a sense of hopefully we can find the right man and, and, and get an infrastructure behind us. I quite like the idea of something we haven't mentioned actually of like a director of football situation. So if we do go for one of the sort of local former players or something like that, like a Phillips or, a, or even a Kevin Ball, like bringing a director of football who knows the league really well um, like, or, or, or knows how to look after a big club really well but doesn't perhaps know Sunderland or... Uh, and try and steer them that way. You know, an unknown, an un- inexperienced coach can be steered. But then I also think, you know, it's not worked at some places. So, um, so many different variables. Um, and it's still nil-nil against Grimsby at the moment. It is. Those, those are all really good questions. I'm sure that people will want to, uh, to to come back to them on um, on social media, I'm sure. Um, Danny, if Can't you wait any- for that. Yeah, absolutely, Danny. Have you got any final thoughts on the on the Ross era before I uh, turn to uh, some of our regular features on uh, shouting out to branches around the world? I think it's come at a time where he's had to go. Um, obviously, we've had good moments at with him in charge, and unfortunately, the two Wembley trips are always going to be tainted by a second half of absolute terrible performances in both Wembley finals and that is just unfortunately the way it always felt under Ross and a lot of fans lost trust in him I certainly lost trust in him it's just one of those inevitable things happens he's gone he's had to go and hopefully we get a new man in he kind of coasts us to January in and around the playoff spot still so we can get some actual players who we've needed for about three or four seasons we're so desperately in need of pace and power in the team probably just pace just pace because if you watch the highlights tonight and the game tonight although Duncan Watmore runs into absolute nothing his pace has looked actually really good in this game and it gives us another dimension and I just I generally don't understand how or why we haven't or anyone in with that kind of skill set, so to speak. So the sacking has, in that respect, and the whole transfers and all that, it's Ross's fault, obviously. He didn't give us another dimension. He went too like for like with everything. He was too samey. He didn't have that dimension to change or anything like that. So, as I said, we just need to pick the right man, take our time, get someone with a bit of experience who is a bit modern and understands what you actually need in football in modern day football get to January around the playoff automatic spot not too far behind and then have a real go in 2020 well I think that sounds like a, a very sensible, a sensible place to leave it look into the future and again look into the future as well I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the branches um, who I've noticed just very quickly on Twitter this evening, because uh, this was a very hastily arranged podcast, as you can imagine. The Peterborough Sports Association branch meeting has been cancelled, they report, but their next one is on November the 4th. And to our friends in North America, uh, I know we've got a good few listeners over there. We've got meetups in Toronto on the 19th and the 26th, and in Portland on the 19th. I'm assuming those are linked to uh, getting together to watch the games in uh, Wickham and Shrewsbury. And we've got a Rugby Report Exiles podcast meetup in Wickham that I think I'm going to be able to get to as well. We've got that coming up. So um, we may well speak to you before then. But if not, um, we'll be reflecting on that game. So uh, thank you very much, John Stacey, for joining me again. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Rich. Cheers, Danny Roberts. Thank you for having me. And thanks for making your debut there, Chris Wynn. We'll speak to you all soon. Ta-ra. Bye.